Welcome, I'm Lee Cowan and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. You may recognize actor F. Murray Abraham from the second season of HBO's White Lotus or from his Oscar winning role as a composer jealous of Mozart in the 1984 film Amadeus. But although he spent six decades in the industry, he's still a man of mystery. The only way to become great is to believe you're great. And that takes a, a certain degree of arrogance. But a truly great actor has to have a sense of humility as well. And that balance, it took me a lot of years to discover that. This will be a discovery to many of you. The F in F. Murray Abraham, he effing made it up. My father's name was Farid, he was uh, Syrian. So I put the F up there in his honor. But also, like you sensed, that that added this tiny little <laughs> whisper of mystery. Yeah, I guess so. I thought uh, just Murray Abraham doesn't seem to have a, a, a ring to it. Later in the show, F. Murray Abraham shares how his late wife, Kate, supported him through his toughest career lows. For a while, you, you were at home, right? Taking care of the kids, <laughs> making dinner, yeah? Yeah, I wasn't very good at it either. <laughs> <laughs> was that uh, frustration with the business that caused that, or just the lean years of being a working actor and trying? Ah, oh, it's the whole thing. It's the frustration, it's the... An actor isn't really an actor unless he's acting. And we all know that. And you begin to question and doubt so you do the classes and you study and you read. And after a while, you, you, you despair that it's ever gonna happen. It's the same old boring story that you've heard so many times. And either you make it, you suck it up, or you make it or you don't. And I don't know how people make it on their own. I had her. That ain't luck, I don't know what is. F. Murray Abraham may have played some larger than life characters, but Connor Knighton has been hanging out with giants of a different sort. Towering Paul Bunyan statues were a popular method of highway advertising back in the 1960s. And thanks to the internet, today they are an increasingly popular roadside attraction. Every giant has their personal story, right? And, and they vary so much, you know? Arms fall off, heads are stolen or missing, and uh, oftentimes people will take pictures and Roadside America will update their site. The site coined the term muffler men after noticing a few businesses had swapped out the bunion axe for a muffler. But the statues have been modified to hold nearly anything. A map chronicles sightings of a whole extended family. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. F. Murray Abraham was running with a rough neighborhood group until he was introduced to Shakespeare in a school class, changing the course of his life and setting him on the path to his life's passion, acting. Here's Ben Mankiewicz. You need some more light? F. Murray Abraham's Academy Award, like its owner, is a bit of a character. Was that a squirrel? Or... No, that was a hamster. It's a... This golden pet doesn't gather dust in a display case. It's a traveling companion. Hello. I hide him on the stage just for fun. And it's in the trash can, he's in a, in a suitcase, he's in a drawer somewhere. Here's what surprised me about F. Murray Abraham. He laughs a lot. <laughs> Here's what didn't surprise me. He's dead serious about his craft. I can't imagine not acting. My work is my salvation. And he's still delivering. <laughs> You're blaming me for your situation? That's rich. As a sexist yet charming patriarch in the White Lotus. And I get older and older, but the women I desire remain young. Natural, right? Or an ill-fated drug dealer in Scarface. I'm doing the talking here, not you. You need to watch my back, watch my back. Or in the role that won him his pet Oscar, a composer bitterly jealous of Mozart in Amadeus. And music. Finished as no music is ever finished. One key to his success, says Abraham, is a six decade career spent believing in his talent. The only way to become great is to believe you're great. And that takes a, a certain degree of arrogance. But a truly great actor has to have a sense of humility as well. And that balance, 
It took me a lot of years to discover that. This will be a discovery to many of you. The F in F. Murray Abraham, he effing made it up. My father's name was Farid. He was uh, Syrian. So I put the F up there in his honor. But also, like you sensed, that that added this tiny little <laughs> whisper of mystery. Yeah, I guess so. I thought uh, just Murray Abraham doesn't seem to have a, a, a ring to it. Born into a blue-collar family in Pittsburgh, Abraham had asthma as a kid, so they moved to El Paso. Cleaner air beckoned. So did trouble. I was kind of a hoodlum. We got in fights, and we stole cars. Very easily, you could have had a different life. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And I took speech and drama, and the teacher was named Lucia P. Hutchins, and she introduced me to Shakespeare. She saved my life, I think. Well, I started acting. I won a state contest. I won a scholarship. Went to college on that scholarship. $100. After college, he moved to New York, where the serious actors were and where the underwear ads were. A limp waistband? No, it's our new superband. When you land a Fruit of the Loom ad yeah. and you're the leaf, yeah. I mean, do you call your folks? <laughs> I'm the no, leaf. they call you. <laughs> I saw you on television. <laughs> <laughs> Movie roles soon came, small ones, but Abraham made them count. 517 is closer and they're in uniform. A good cop and all the president's men. Police! Put your hands up! A bad one in Serpico. Frank, why don't you go up there and check it out? Well, why don't you? I got the wrong clothes. I'll take you shopping. Mm -hmm. When he wasn't looking for work, he was perfecting that distinct style of speech. You grow up in El Paso, speaking Spanish a lot of the time. Yep. So where is this accent? What is this? I realized that uh, my accent was going to be in the way because I began to listen to myself. I began to listen to records by Gilgood and Olivier because I wanted to do Shakespeare. If there be any good thing to be done that may to thee do ease and grace to me, speak to me. And I realized that my accent was wrong. It was in the way. So I began to study what they sounded like, and I began to imitate them. Oh, love! Well, of course, in Italy we know nothing about love. <laughs> it all came together, the accent, the way he carries himself, the confidence that leaps off the screen when director Milos Forman cast him as Salieri, the villain in Amadeus. That was Mozart. Wolfgang. Amadeus. Mozart. Salieri was the part of parts. Abraham beat the odds, then beat Jeff Bridges, Albert Finney, Sam Waterston, and his co-star Tom Holtz to win the Academy Award for Best Actor in 1985. The winner is F. Murray Abraham. I was wearing my lucky socks that you night. Were, yeah. Do you ever go online? Do you ever watch your, that moment? I do. It was a pretty good speech. It would be a lie if I told you I didn't know what to say because I've been working on this speech for about 25 years. <laughs> the Oscar came with fame and offers to work, but not the kind of offers Murray expected or wanted. I felt like that award for that performance demanded that I do something equally good, equally as prestigious and as, as honorable. And all the stuff that was being offered was just terrible. So I started doing theater. Theater for 90 bucks a week. Did that cost you, you think? Yeah, I think it did. I think it absolutely did. You realize that you need the arrogance to support yourself. Otherwise, you're going to get beaten down. So that when you finally do become successful, you become super arrogant and a little bit impossible to get along with. There's also been some controversy. He was fired from the Apple TV series Mythic Quest after allegations of sexual misconduct. In a statement, Abraham said, this is a sincere and deeply felt apology. He said he told jokes, nothing more, adding, I have grown in my understanding from this experience. It's been a difficult last year for Abraham. He lost the person who's been by his side for much of his life, his wife Kate, Half of this statue belongs to my beloved wife, Kate. Thank you. 
You strike me as just grounded about the mistakes that you made in your career and about what went well. I'm, I'm gonna guess being married for 60 years had a great deal to do with that. It's absolutely. Ah. Well, my marriage is the rock of my life. It's as simple as that. She never lost faith. And there were some hard times, baby. She supported this family for years. The luckiest day of my life was meeting Kate. Give you one? Yeah. A few minutes later, we got to talking about the vocal exercises Abraham, now 83, does every single day. And with old woes, new wail, my dear time's waste. He recites from memory various Shakespeare sonnets. Clearly, Kate is still on his mind. But if the while I think on thee, dear friend, all losses are restored and sorrows end. Abraham admits it's hard being in the house without Kate. The good news is the work keeps coming. Does it feel any different now to be part of an ensemble cast like White Lotus in your 80s than it did to be uh, in your early 40s? making Amadeus? That's really a very hard question to answer. I believe that I haven't changed that much in terms of who and what I think I am, but I, I really believe in the dignity of acting. So you're gonna keep at it, I take it. My dream is to die on stage. <laughs> Up next, an exclusive excerpt from our chat with F. Murray Abraham, something you can only see right here on CBS News Stream. Stay with us. I remember trying my best not to keep running over speeches that I was going to make. As promised, here's more from Ben Mankiewicz and F. Murray Abraham. But Murray Abraham is not mysterious. F. Murray Abraham. What's that guy's deal? There's a follow-up question that you instantly want to ask. It's interesting. Some people call me F. <laughs> do <Fur>. they? Yeah. <laughs> what do your friends call you? They call me Your Majesty, usually. <laughs> your Highness. Murray. They, they call you Murray? Yeah. Everybody calls you Murray. Yeah. yeah. I think Mel Brooks said something about that being a funny name. And he said, there was one funny guy there, Murray. <laughs> and it's a funny name. Well, he's a funny guy. Mel is a funny guy. For a while, you, you were at home, right? Taking care of the kids, <laughs> making dinner, yeah? Yeah, I wasn't very good at it either. <laughs> <laughs> was that uh, frustration with the business that caused that or just the lean years of being a working actor and trying? Ah, oh, it's the whole thing. It's the frustration, it's the... An actor isn't really an actor unless he's acting. And we all know that. And you begin to question and doubt so you do the classes and you study and you read. And after a while, you, you, you despair that it's ever gonna happen. It's the same old boring story that you've heard so many times. And either you make it, you suck it up, or you make it or you don't. And I don't know how people make it on their own. I had her. That ain't luck, I don't know what is. What do you remember from uh, Oscar night? I remember trying my best not to keep running over speeches that I was gonna make. I thought, you jerk. <laughs> what if you don't win? Are you gonna get up and make a speech anyway? <laughs> <laughs> that would have been arrogant. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta tell you, man, for a while, it's like you, <laughs> you wake up with a speech going on yeah. and you think, well, I'll use that one. No, I'll use this one. No, I'll use this angry one. No, are you? <laughs> I wonder if everybody goes through that. I remember, I think I saw Meryl one time with a, with a, a list of people she wanted to thank. I said, no, that's smart. Right. You don't have to go over the speech, I have it written down. Mm -hmm. And if you don't use it, you just tear it up. Tear it up, <laughs> nobody knows. That's a good speech, it's a nice moment. I mean. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know it was gonna come out that way. The, the, the uh, audience applauded for so long, I should have stopped them because there were people I wanted to thank and I didn't have time to. I should have just gone through and done it. We uh, take ourselves far too seriously. That was what I was doing wrong for so many years. I was taking myself far too seriously. I mean, I want to be taken as a serious actor and an artist and so on, 
but it doesn't mean you have to be arch. You can be that way and also have a good time. It took me a long time to discover that. I'm still very talented and I'm still funny, <laughs> right? You, you can, can do both. Up next, meet the small family of gigantic muffler men. Welcome back. Muffler men, fiberglass roadside figures that once towered over America's highways, have been largely forgotten. Connor Knighton discovered an enthusiastic online community, though, that's keeping tabs on the remaining statues, and one man determined to restore and preserve as many of them as possible. Joel Baker is a giant hunter. He travels in search of towering sentinels, which watch over small businesses all across the country. We got one foot that's still here. It's a quest that began more than 10 years ago, when he became fascinated by a family of fiberglass figures collectively known as the Muffler Men. I think it's just because I'd never heard of it before. They were larger than life. It was like they were these massive things that were so hard to miss and yet hardly anybody knew about them or cared. And I think that intrigued me. Back in the 1960s, these 20 foot tall characters were considered the height of outdoor advertising. Businesses purchased figures from California company International Fiberglass, which had acquired a mold for a Paul Bunyan character. It could be modified to promote all sorts of establishments. The arms, they made two different versions of how the arms fit into the sleeve, and I can tell by looking at him that he is a very early version. This is the first version they made, and then they modified their design. The giant watching over Lauderback Tire in Springfield, Illinois, was one of those early Bunyan designs. He's been moved back and forth to different locations, has survived a tornado decapitation, he's featured in local radio ads. I am Lauderback Man. I am Springfield. Let me see the back of the shirt. Yeah. According to co-owner Mark Lauderback, he remains a pillar of the community wow. to this day. No one knows where we're at until we say, hey, look for the giant. And they're like, oh, yeah, I know exactly where you're at. So. The giants were originally intended to draw attention to local businesses, but they've since become attractions in their own right, thanks to a fan community that coalesced around the website Roadside America. Every giant has their personal story, right? And, and they vary so much, you know? Arms fall off, heads are stolen or missing, and uh, oftentimes people will take pictures and Roadside America will update their site. The site coined the term muffler men after noticing a few businesses had swapped out the bunion axe for a muffler. But the statues have been modified to hold nearly anything. A map chronicles sightings of a whole extended family. Some consider these Vikings part of the cast of characters, as well as these ladies, the Uniroyal Tire Girls. In the 1970s, International Fiberglass stopped making the figures. The craze had cooled off. Many of the giants were torn down and tossed aside. They're thought to be just a few hundred left. Every once in a while, there's one resurface that's been in someone's backyard that we never knew about in storage. That's my favorite part of all of this is the hunt. You know, looking for something that's lost. You got pictures of a giant in a town in 1984, and then what happened to that? That's what I love to do. Baker and friends like Michael Yunkin have started a side business tracking down, collecting, and restoring the characters. We're at the uh, greenhouse of Crystal Lake and uh, just north of Chicago. Documenting their quest on their YouTube channel, American Giants. This one's unique in that his, uh, the fiberglass overlaps on a shirt here. I've never seen that before. Today, restored figures in good condition can sell for tens of thousands of dollars. Is it a challenge to make your new repair match the old form? So that's something that we spend a lot of time trying to fix. And when we are fixing cracks, it's trying to line things up perfect back to the way that they were. Because we want it to be original. We don't want to see any weird modifications to it. So you're going to bolt this, and then we're going to flip them, and you're going to fiberglass. Yep. The team is currently at work on preserving the legacy of these figures. They've recently created a small museum of giants in Atlanta, Illinois, just down the road from a hot dog man. It's really a shame to have giants and have them where nobody can see them. These were built to be out where the public can enjoy them and visit them, take their pictures. If only the statues could speak. They have seen it all. 
unflinching witnesses to decades of road trip history, providing countless smiles to help break up the miles. I'm Lee Cowan. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you right back here next time on Here Comes the Sun.